uh, recent study or a study that has been used a lot recently in various articles where we say or where the authors are saying that the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, potentially is uh, attacking the one beta chain of the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells and causing the disease. So this is where discussion now, many people have reached out to me as well. So I want to make sure that is given and we can make, we can form an opinion instead of just uh, re reading various articles. And I would show you some of the articles. Hey, Ruslana. Hey, Harry, how are you? I'll show you some of the articles and have you form your opinion as well. So once again, the discussion that has been uh, in the media everywhere nowadays has been that somehow there is a study that says that the, the coronavirus attacks the hemoglobin, especially the beta chains, and causes the disease for hemoglobin. And that is an important thing to consider. So let's look at it together. I have the study here as well. And I have, so before the study, let me let me show you how media is uh, looking at it. So here uh, you can see, this is the original study. It is um, published in chemrxiv.org. Yes, uh, Rebecca, thank you very much. And I think it is a really important topic because there is so much media hype today. There are so many articles, YouTube videos, and people are just putting up this shocking news that the virus actually uh, attacks the hemoglobin and that is what causes the disease. And there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there. So I wanted to make sure that we look at it together. So that is our property, <laughs> we over here. We, we nerd out about medicine. We look at things together and we become smarter every day about medicine. So look at this. I, before you guys joined, I did this little uh, search on Google, coronavirus attacks heme. And just look at it, 50,000 results. This is the original study. COVID-19 attacks the one beta chain of hemoglobin. Then if you see here, researcher reveals, research reveals that COVID-19 attacks hemoglobin in red blood cells. So, so notice the word here in red blood cell. If you look at the original study, they do not say it. They say COVID-19 attacks the one beta chain of hemoglobin and captures the uh, porphyrin to inhibit human heme metabolism. They never said in the red blood cell. And I'll show you why this is important. Then over here, there is a ivermectin. So people have now started talking about even the uh, medicines for this. Uh, then if you see here, uh, COVID-19 attacks the one beta chain of hemoglobin. Uh, there is another study I was seeing. Look at this one. Scientists study coronavirus attack on hemoglobin and iron in the red blood cells of those who become ill. See, in the red blood cells of those who become. So there are so many of the discussions where people just continuously are saying, good morning, everyone. They're continuously saying that somehow the coronavirus is attacking the RBCs, going inside the RBCs and attacking the hemoglobin or heme. So I want to go over this with you right now. I want to make sure that our, our lecture is short as well. People have been complaining that our lectures are too long, but I think that it is important for us to understand the mechanism mechanisms so we can form our own opinions. So look at it. I'm going to go over this study here. Here is the PDF here, which I have marked. So I've been studying this study. And let's look at this for the, here what they're saying. They're saying, so first of all, please realize they did not do this study in vivo. That is, it is not a study done in the human or animal bodies. This is a study done with computer simulations. So it is not a study done by um, inside any of the human body uh, or animal body or cells. It is not an in vivo study. It's not even an in vitro study. It is really a study that is done um, 
on the computer. So let's look at it. They are saying open reading frame 1AB protein. So this is a coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 virus has multiple proteins. And so the protein open reading frame 1AB protein, 10 protein, 3A protein could coordinate attack so this is a translation from Chinese, so please pardon the grammar. Attack the heme on one beta chain of hemoglobin to dissociate the iron from the porphyrin. So let's actually look at the structure of the study or these, the molecular structures. So look, what happens is that hemoglobin, hemoglobin is formed in this way that first of all, we have pyrrol rings these are nitrogenous rings these are molecules that have nitrogen in them and they are naturally occurring molecules so we take four pyrroles they are all nitrogen based and we put them together and this makes a proto proto porphyrin in this case, it is called protoporphyrin 9. So first thing to keep in mind. So there are some things that I'm going to request you to keep in mind while, while we look at this discussion so that you can connect the dots. So the first important dot is to keep in mind that there is porphyrin that the authors will be talking about, authors of the study. So these porphyrins are nothing but they are pyrrole rings. Pyrrole, I hope my spellings are correct. Pyrrol rings, four of them connected together. This is called porphyrin. When we attach a ferrous in the center of them, so if I make another set here and I put a ferrous, ferrous, ferrous is divalent, that means it has two um, valency electrons. The, the divalent ferrous. This ferrous here, divalent ferrous can make six bonds. It can make six bonds, six bonds. So four of the bonds are made by, with these nitrogens. I do not know if it is one line or two. And then two bonds are present freely. One bond will be combining with globin. <laughs> So before that, this part, ferrous plus porphyrin is called heme. When this connects with the, pro, uh, with the globular protein, which is called globin, then this becomes hemoglobin, hemoglobin. And the final free bond here combines with oxygen molecule or carbon dioxide. So this is the basic structure. Are we all on the same page that there is a pyrrole ring? We take four of those rings, combine them together. That makes protoporphyrin. We take protoporphyrin and attach a ferrous in it. And that becomes heme. This becomes heme. This, this thing is heme. Then we attach a globin to it and it becomes hemoglobin. And then one more bond with oxygen and that become oxygenated hemoglobin. Good. Any problem with this? Any problem with this? Respects back to you. OK, so now let's look at, I'm assuming that there is no problem. Let us now look at that study. Basically, what that study is saying, if I am here, basically, that study is saying this. They are saying, if you take a hemoglobin molecule, so I'm making a hemoglobin molecule. So pay attention here, please. This is the important part. What they're saying is interesting to know. You take a hemo, hemoglobin molecule. This is a hemoglobin molecule. There is a globin attached. And then you bring coronavirus coronavirus near this molecule. So let's say this is a coronavirus. 
Now, in the coronavirus, they say that we have, remember, there are S proteins. We talk about these structures every day now. There are S proteins. Then there are M proteins. Then there are E proteins. E proteins. And then, of course, inside the coronavirus are the is the RNA with the nucleocaps, uh, nu uh, capsid proteins or N proteins. Good. This is the structure of the virus. Keep this in mind because this is also something that is going to be used. There are S proteins, the spike proteins. There are M proteins. There are E proteins and then N proteins. They are saying, and then there are some proteins that are kind of non uh, functional proteins, which are ORF, open reading frame, 1A, 1B, open reading frame, 10, open reading frame, 8. These are also proteins that are present in the virus, and they are, they are not really interesting for us for our discussion, but for this research, these are. Here is what they're saying. They're saying, this virus, when it comes near the hemoglobin, some of these proteins here will attack and break the ferrous, the globin out of it, one. And secondly, some of them would attack the ferrous and remove that out of it. So what are we going to be left with? We are going to be left with porphyrins, correct? So when you remove the globin, and when you remove the heme, you are left with porphyrin. So because now we, the virus, according to the study, because the virus has broken the hemoglobin, this ferrous is going to separate and become increased in the blood. Increased level of ferrous in the blood which will cause its own harm by causing inflammation. So one, increased level of ferrous because how did the ferrous become separated? Because the virus attacked the hemoglobin and removed some of the proteins from the virus helped remove the ferrous from the, uh, from the hemoglobin. So because ferrous is separated, now it is increased in the blood, that ferrous, increased level of ferrous is going to be harmful. And what are the, what is the proof that it is harmful? They say that you can see that serum ferritin of the patients is increased. So there are harmful levels of ferrous in the serum because of that, and you, or you can prove it by seeing that there are ferritin levels that are increased. Secondly, they are saying that you would also see that neutrophil levels are reduced. Thirdly, they say that you would see inflammatory proteins are incre increased. For example, C-reactive proteins. Inf inflammatory proteins are increased. C-reactive protein. Right? So this is what they're saying. The virus attacked the hemoglobin. Ferrous got separated. Our iron got separated. We are now left with heme. And this porphyrin... This porphyrin, we are not left with heme, we are left with porphyrin. Then they say that virus loves to bind with the porphyrin. The coronavirus itself loves to now bind with the porphyrins. And they are saying that if it binds with the porphyrin, there are two outcomes of this. When it binds with the porphyrin, it does two things. Number one, number one, they say in the study, again, I'm not saying it. This is not the mechanism. I want you to see what they are saying. They are saying that one benefit of virus connecting with the porphyrin is that porphyrin helps the virus enter our cells. So they are saying that porphyrin, I'm just going to make porphyrin like quickly like these boxes. So don't mind. So they are saying virus is sitting on the porphyrin. And porphyrin makes it easy to enter the cell. So remember, we have been saying that coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell through the ACE2 receptors. 
ACE2 receptors. This study authors say, no, this can also happen with the porphyrins. That virus sits on the porphyrins and enters the cell and that is how it infects. That is one effect. Second effect of binding with the porphyrin is that the available porphyrin, available porphyrin, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, please don't kill me. Available porphyrin is now reduced because it is occupied by the virus. When the available porphyrin is reduced, that means hemoglobin synthesis is going to be reduced. When the hemoglobin synthesis is reduced, then we have less hemoglobin in the RBC, which means RBC's oxygen carrying capacity is reduced. Correct, which means severe damage because of because of low oxygen, because oxygen capacity is gone, which would then cause inflammation and more damage. So check this out once again. I'm gonna repeat this once more just so that we are on the same page. What are they saying is in the study that virus connects with the hemoglobin. It separates out the ferrous, it removes the globin, and we are left with the porphyrin. The ferrous that is now increased in the blood causes harm by its own process, and that is that that can be proved that there is increased ferritin level and there is increased neutrophil. Remember, ferritin level is necessary for to bind with the iron. So if there is more iron there is more ferritin. So increased ferritin is an indicator that there is more iron, which they say in the study means virus is doing something to the iron. And then as there is more free iron, that causes a lot of inflammation. And that also reduces the neutrophils. Good. Then they say the porphyrin itself, when the virus is attached to it, it has two benefits. One benefit to the virus is that virus uses the porphyrin to enter the cell and infect them. And the second is that the virus, because it is connected to porphyrin, porphyrin is not available to, to make the hemoglobin. When there is not much hemoglobin in the RBCs, then the oxygen carrying capacity is reduced, which would then cause severe damage, hypoxemia, hypoxia, and, and, and tissue damage. Good. So tell me this, that do we all understand the mechanism that they are trying to propose? Do we all understand the mechanism? No worries, you can uh, look at it later. Do we understand the mechanism of the study? Now I'm gonna go back to study and prove to you that this study may not be exactly correct. So there are presumptions in there. There are some things in there, which when you look at the study, you will, the, the articles that are out there that we found that the virus is killing the heme, that is not the case. So I'm gonna show you from the study itself. So let's look at that. Let's look at the study now. First of all, understand this, that this study is done by, look at this. In this study, conserved domain analysis, homology modeling, and molecular docking were used to, to do the research. So this research is actually done on a computer. It is not done in vitro or it is not done in vivo. It is done on a simulation on a computer. So what they're saying is we went to a computer model and we asked the computer if we asked the computer if the virus proteins can connect with hemoglobin and the computer said yes. So let's say this is hemoglobin. And they said virus proteins can connect with it and the binding capacity is better because of that the, the hemoglobin is damaged. So first important thing to note, they are not saying 
that we did this study in some cells or we did this study in some patients. This is a study done on a computer model, number one. Number two, look at this. This paper is only for academic discussion. The correctness needs to be confirmed by other lab laboratories. They are not even standing behind the correctness of this. They're saying, you guys go figure it out if it is correct or not. This is what we think it would happen because our computer shows it would happen. Okay, so then they say here, the virus has structural proteins, spike protein, envelope protein, and proteins. We talked about it. Then some other proteins. And then they are saying, look at this. This report demonstrates that the hemoglobin and neutrophil count, so they are saying counts are reduced, CD active protein is increased, albumin is increased, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is increased. All of that means that heme, oh, sorry, free iron is increased. Guys, free iron is increased. It can be increased in many cases. Uh, inflammation can occur because there is a virus in there. It is not necessary that because the virus has attacked the hemoglobin, only then this would happen. They are not able to prove that it attacks the hemoglobin in, the, in a cell or in body. Then they say, um, down here, I'm going to go to the, their discussion. The last part now. Look at this discussion now. It is so crazy. I was laughing when I was reading it. Do you know how they do you know how they try to connect the dots? Do, do you know how they try to connect the dots? And again, I don't want to make fun of them. They have done a study, they have tried to prove that this may be a mechanism. We need to now figure out if this is really true or not. But I hate it that people have started saying we should start giving Favipravir and we should start giving uh, other drugs to take care of this issue. And so that's what they did was the authors added two drugs in the whole mix as well. They said chloroquine and Favipravir can help. To some extent, they can bind to the virus and not allow it to bind to porphyrin and Re reduce this effect. But this is all computer modeling. They have not proved it anywhere. So if you want to believe the study, you have to go prove it or ask someone to prove it in vivo or in vitro. That means in the body or outside. Now, check this out. The very first interesting thing is they're saying, why do we think that the virus would connect with porphyrin? Why would the virus connect with the, okay, fine. Computer says it can connect with the porphyrin, but why would it connect? And the answer they are giving is very, very interesting. Look at this. They are saying that we believe <laughs> the viruses are ancient. Coronavirus is an ancient virus. In the old times, I don't know when, hundreds of years or millions of years ago, Viruses used to connect with porphyrins to get energy, and then that porphyrin and virus would enter the cells. So they are proposing or together a new mechanism of virus survival in the past. They are saying this paper proposes that a virus could be bound to the porphyrin, which could explain the survival problem of an original virus. So they have gone all the way back to the evolution and said virus wanted to be connected to porphyrin. We don't know that. They don't know that. But that is their basic foundation. If you accept that foundation, you would accept the rest of the paper as well. So we don't know. <laughs> maybe that is true. Maybe that is not true. We have no idea. But they have altogether proposed a new mechanism of the vi virus survival in the past, in millions of years ago. So let's say we accept them. We say, fine, you guys are correct. Somewhere in the past, viruses used to use porphyrin for energy. They would bind to them. And because porphyrin can allow to go in the cell, they then use that to go in the cells as well. And one more thing I want to clarify here, that the porphyrins are present abundantly in our tissues. They're present in liver. They're present in kidney. They're present in our blood. They're pr present in our interstitial fluid. We have lots of porphyrins or, or, or types of porphyrins available in the tissue, then those porphyrins are used up by our bone marrow as well to make, make hemoglobin by attaching ferrous and globin to it. So porphyrins are abundant substance in our body. So they are saying because it is abundant in our body, virus must be 
in the old time must be connecting with it and then going in the cell. Have they proved it? No. They, did they simulate it on computer? Yes. So going back to the study. Then, so that is one assumption. Second thing, they are saying porphyrins have an ability to penetrate a cell membrane and go into the cell. And now they're saying if the virus sits on the porphyrin, then the virus will go in as well. So here they are saying, we believe, look at this statement. This is a beautiful statement. They are saying, we believe that in addition to the invasive method of spike ACE2, virus should maintain the original invasive pattern of using porphyrins. So again, if, if it is the porphyrin that is the right vehicle for virus, we don't know. Have we proved it from other studies? We don't know. Then they say that porphyrins are available everywhere in our body, which is fine. Our validation analysis showed. So this is the, this is the dangerous part where people are taking this and now saying we should start giving Fevipravir to everyone and we should start giving chloroquine to everyone. Guys, they did not prove anything. Our validation analysis showed that Fevipravir could only prevent the binding of envelope protein and porphyrin virus and porphyrin. Meanwhile, chloroquine could effectively prevent the binding of E2 glycoprotein to porphyrin. Therefore, the ineffectivity of novel coronavirus pneumonia was not completely prevented by these drugs. They say it in their paper. It is not completely. They say they may affect them. And that again is a computer simulation. So maybe it is true, maybe it is not true, but the whole world should not start going and using Fevipravir because this model showed it. And I have even more interesting thing out here. Then they say higher hemoglobin causes higher mor morbidity. So they are saying that higher levels of hemoglobin means that there is higher morbidity. And what does that mean? What they're trying to say over there is that men have more hemoglobin than women. And men are dying more by SARS-CoV-2. So maybe it is because men have more hemoglobin and virus is connecting with the hemoglobin. That is why men are dying more. Well, there are many more studies. Some people say men are dirtier than women. We don't clean our hands that much. We are not neat as much as women are. And they say because we don't clean our hands, we don't wash ourselves correctly, we do not change our clothes correctly, we do not keep ourselves neat, maybe that is a reason. Then there is another theory that women have estrogen and estrogen helps the, their immune system to stay strong. This is why women have more auto, autoimmune diseases because their immune system is stronger because of estrogen. And men do not have estrogen. And maybe that is the reason that women get less sick with SARS-CoV-2. Actually, it is two to one. For each two men, there is one woman. So these authors <laughs> have connected that because men have more hemoglobin, that must prove that their theory is correct. So again, uh, I don't know what to say. Going, going back here. So higher hemoglobin causes higher mortality. So that is where they've connecting it to the human uh, men. So if you see here, the number of normal men is significantly higher than that of normal women, which might also be a reason why men are more likely to be infected by the coronavirus. Okay, fine. Then next discussion point, inhibiting the heme anabolic pathway and causing the disease. They are saying, and I showed that here, in here, that what they're saying is, they're saying that because the heme, because the heme anabolic pathways are now destroyed, which causes less hemoglobin, which causes less oxygen carrying capacity, which causes damage. But that can only happen if we basically understand that their theory in vivo and in vitro can be proved. So Really, really interesting. Then let's continue so we can be efficient on time. Viral protein infects hemoglobin by the immune hemolysis of red blood cells. So now this is the funniest thing here. See, the problem is 
how does the virus so this is an rbc hemoglobin is inside the rbc virus has to first go into the hemoglobin into the rbc to then attack the hemoglobin correct but they are saying well that's not the case you know that there is a regular hemolysis of the rbc which is correct if i if i do this right now or if, or if i um if i run if i run if i just clap i'm killing the rbcs if i run i'm killing the RV, rbcs rbcs have, have a lifetime of 90 to 120 days they are hem hemolyzing all the time then other chemicals other drugs other viruses other bacteria many things can break rbcs so they are using that that, hey, that rbc when hemoglobin comes out of the rbc then the virus attacks it fine so now we have to wait for the hemoglobin to come out we have to wait for the presumption it is not even proved that virus would attack it then we would assume that this hemoglobin cannot be recycled into more hemoglobin because virus has taken it and now we are deficient on hemoglobin so look at their study they are saying it in their study Look at this red line here. We cannot simulate whether viral protein attack hemoglobin outside or inside the red blood cells. Do you read this? How can we justify when people are saying research reveal that COVID-19 attacks hemoglobin in the red blood cells? How can we say that? How can this scientist study coronavirus attack on hemoglobin in the red blood cells? Who, who added this in the red blood cell? I am getting so sick of people doing this to others at this time when we need to be more careful and take care of our patients instead of creating fake theories and diverting the resources. Look, I'm spending an hour with you now talking about it, which is a useless study. And not only this, people are writing articles about it. And I have been inundated by the messages from people that, hey, you should talk about Fevipravir, we should talk about chloroquine, you should talk about the hemoglobin effect, that is the right effect, that is what is causing the lung inflammation, it is, we don't need to be on ventilators, this is all a different type of a disease, and you are looking at pneumonia, and this is actually the hemoglobin destruction. What the heck is this? They themselves are saying here, we cannot simulate whether viral proteins attack hemoglobin outside or inside the red blood cells. Okay, continuing. Are you with me so far? Are we becoming smarter about this or not? The complexity of individual immune system. Then they simply put their hands up once again and say, we cannot really say how the immune system is going to respond because everybody's immune system is different. So, man, they created a computer simulation where they proved that the virus can connect with hemoglobin, but then they gave a lot of information telling that, hey, do not believe us that much. <laughs> so they're saying it, but people have just picked up their message and just run with it. So their conclusion, the study results show that ORF8 and surface glycoproteins could combine to the, could combine to the complex at the same time. So what they're saying is that part of virus combines with the hemoglobin and makes porphyrin from it. Then another part of the virus connects with the porphyrins and that causes the porphyrin not to be available for, um, for further hemoglobin synthesis, right? So this is what they are, this is what they're saying. And then they're saying, since the porphyrin complexes the virus produced in the human body inhibited the heme anabolic pathway, they cause a wide, wide range of infections. What they're saying is that infection is not just in the epithelium, not in just the lungs. It is an infection in a whole body because the virus is attacking hemoglobin everywhere. With these findings in mind, further analysis revealed that chloroquine could prevent and similarly, they'll talk about the fevipravir. Fevipravir could inhibit the envelope. And then once again, they say at the end, this paper is only for academic discussion. The correctness needs to be confirmed by laboratories. 
we look forward for the laboratories to prove this is wrong or correct. So you tell me. So I'll, I'll stop this discussion in five minutes. You tell me, what do you think? Yes, Tony, you're correct. So what do you think? Absolutely, Kevin, you are absolutely correct. Meaning we can say that, yeah, this is a possibility. They have shown it in the computers. There may be something. But people are now asking questions. They're saying, let's start giving Fevi Pravir. They are saying that they have found another disease. The disease is altogether different. Guys, come on. So you, I understand, but question is this. So the so here is a believer to the study that they are saying that the hum, the patient's uh, blood counts are telling the story which goes with this theory. Man, we already know that there is inflammation. So that tells the story of inflammation, not that this is hemoglobin. Increased ferritin can be for many reasons. They say it in their paper that ferritin can be increased in porphyrias. Ferrit ferritin can be increased by inflammation. Ferritin can be increased by many other diseases as well. Ferritin can be increased by RBC hemolysis for any inflammatory. If there is inflammation going on and hemolysis is occurring, ferritin is going to increase. So I hope that this is clear. I'm not going to give a verdict to say this study is wrong. They have done a computational model and they have given a study out. This need to be proved more. But I would disagree with people saying that based on the study, let's start treating with Fevi Pravir. That I do not agree with. Although I will give you this, that Fevi Pravir is not very harmful, but I think the harm in this case is that if I get the disease and my, my family feels that I should get Fevipravir and imagine if Fevipravir is not going to do anything because this is not happening in me, then we would have a false hope. If we don't take the right medicine or, or support, I might die. That is the harm in it. Yes. Yes. And so look, all of us time, all, all of our time, massive amount of time is spent on talking about a paper, which is not even in vitro. It is in not even in vivo. It is in a computer. I respect them for doing it. They have a 30 page long research. They have done computational models. They have done study on it. They spent time on it. I respect it. But then I do not like when people are saying that now let's just take this study and start going um, uh, start going in this direction. So I hope this is clear. I am going to I'm going to now hang up so that the the duration of the video stays short. Even now it is forty minutes. I cannot imagine how we went so long, but I hope these are helpful. Tomorrow, tomorrow, please note we're going to talk about hydroxychloroquine and zinc in the latest studies. So I've talked about hydroxychloroquine and zinc before. But now I want to talk about hydroxychloroquine, its effect on pregnant women, it, uh, its use with zinc, and the newer studies coming out of the US that our people are using, and what is the outcome of that. And we'll talk about its safety margin. We'll talk about its prophylaxis. That is, I think, a more interesting thing to talk about than these uh, studies. And please remember, chloroquine is much more harmful than hydroxychloroquine. So never, never, never prescribe chloroquine to a COVID patient. So same time, 6 p.m. tomorrow, Pacific time. So uh, James, exactly, you're correct. My thought would have been we are all medical students. We are all medical doctors. We are nurses. We are healthcare professionals. If somebody talks about a study, we go and read the study. We make an opinion. We figure out what is right and what is wrong. Good. So I hope this is clear to everyone. 
Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to hang up. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about hydroxychloroquine. Tomorrow, what we'll do is we'll talk about managing the mild cases and, and more than a little more ill than my mild cases in the outpatient. And we'll talk about hydroxychloroquine and zinc. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you for your time. And bye-bye for now. Please, please, please share these with your friends.